Hello, we're Andy, the maniacal cinephile, and every November, in between fighting hordes of shoppers and stuffing our face with turkey, we like to review a zombie movie. Today, we're heading to the Unita Medical Supply Warehouse and dissecting the return of the living dead. Send more barf bags. And more lotion. After Night of the Living Dead, director George A. Romero and writer John Russo went their separate ways. Russo retained the rights to any movie titles featuring Living Dead. That's why Romero's sequels were titled Dawn of the Dead and so forth. Meanwhile, Russo wrote a book titled The Return of the Living Dead in hopes of turning it into a 3D movie directed by the Texas Chainsaw Massacre's Toby Hooper. You're telling me those cans could have been in my face? Russo's book is set a decade after the first zombie outbreak. A bus crashes in a small American town, killing everyone on board. Local churchgoers rush to the scene to save the living and destroy the dead. But it's too late. A new plague has been unleashed. Like the fleas from our cats. Obviously, that didn't happen, and what we got was The Return of the Living Dead, the 1985 horror comedy written and directed by Dan O'Bannon in his directorial debut. O'Bannon wrote the screenplay for Alien, and later wrote Life Force, Invaders from Mars, and Total Recall. This Dan guy is onto something. When producer Tom Fox handed O'Bannon Russo's script, he refused to direct it as is and rewrote it. He felt it was too much of a serious attempt at making a sequel to Night of the Living Dead and didn't want to intrude on Romero's turf. You do not want Romero driving past your home, shooting up the place! The plot was completely changed. O'Bannon added humor and set the film in a fictional universe where Night of the Living Dead is a movie based on true events. Oh, like Ratatouille. O'Bannon tore apart Russo's script like a ravenous zombie. So let's see if Return of the Living Dead is worth returning to. While waiting out the zombie apocalypse, you'll need something to kill the time. Like today's sponsor, you guessed it, Raid Shadow Legends. Wait, Evil, how did you get a sponsor? Shut it, you've heard the name, but do you know what you're missing? We're talking hundreds of champions to collect, a super in-depth RPG battle system, amazing graphics, and intense PvE boss fights. I'm not done, Evil. Are you making deals behind my back? But Andy, they're giving away Sun Wakong for free. He's very powerful and has his own special abilities. Great. Now you got good Andy doing it too. I was waiting at the mechanic because I ran over some person. Dear. And the single player campaign helped pass the time. Wait, you did what to my car? Click our link in the description, or scan our QR code to get insane bonuses, like two epic champions, plus a third champion, Sun Wakong, when you use the promo code MONKEYKING for free. As king of the monkeys, I must protect all monkeys. This promo code will only be available within the first 72 hours of registering, so be fast! Just hit my link in the description, and I'll see you on the battlefield! The film is set on July 3rd, 1984, at the Unita Medical Supply Warehouse. Although the movie is set in Louisville, Kentucky, it was actually filmed around L.A. Frank, the foreman, is packing some skeletons while training the new employee, Freddy, played by Tom Matthews, a.k.a. Tommy Jarvis from Jason Lives. No, I think that there's a skeleton farm over in India. Are the skeletons grass-fed? Films like The Texas Chainsaw Massacre and Poltergeist used real skeletons from India because it was cheaper than buying plastic ones. 
Unita also carries split dogs for vet schools and fresh cadavers. We used to get more inventory than this, but uh, yeah, we're expecting the shipment on Monday. Gotta love that Amazon Prime delivery! Freddy asks Frank about the weirdest thing he's seen in there, and he explains that Night of the Living Dead was based on true events. <laughs> Come on, you're shitting me, right? I ain't never been more serious in my life. He swore the same thing when relocating the cemetery. You left the bodies and you only moved the headstones! <laughs> That's not possible. I mean, they showed zombies taking over the world. Whoa! You can't say zombie in a zombie movie! You have to call them ghouls, the undead, infected, walkers, roamers, lurkers, biters, rotters, shufflers, zeds, or zed heads. What really happened was, back in 1969 in Pittsburgh... 69? But the movie came out in 1968! I'm starting to think this didn't really happen! Frank then tries to impress Freddy by showing him the military drums that wound up in the basement due to a delivery error years ago. The drums house the zombies and a toxic gas called trioxin. You say that thing was alive? Trioxin was developed by the Darrow Chemical Company, a play on the real-life Dow Chemical Company, which developed Agent Orange, used by the military in Vietnam. Leak? Hell no, these things were made by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Imagine a car salesman smacking the hood of a car, and it blows up! Unleashing the toxic gas melts the cadaver inside. This effect was achieved using wax and heat. The glass breaking was a happy accident. Which is how our mother described us. You know what? I never said happy. Meanwhile, Freddy's girlfriend Tina and his friends, Spider, Trash, Chuck, Casey, Scuzz, and Suicide wait for Freddy to finish work by fooling around in Resurrection Cemetery. Speaking of Friday the 13th, the actors who play Suicide and Spider also appear in Friday the 13th, Part 5. Man, what a hideous, ugly place. I like it. It's a statement. Come on. Mm, more like a cry for help. Frank and Freddy wake up, discovering the zombie in the drum is missing. Christ, I never smelled anything like that before. He's never had a dance from a 500 pound stripper. Everything smells like an armpit. The gas leaked into the vents, reanimating the specimens. Do they also split the vet bill? We can think, we can think. Come on. To get the butterflies to flutter, they simply blew some air at them. Frank decides to call his boss, Bert, and if you pause and read the eye exam, it says, Bert is a slave driver and a cheap son of a bitch who's going bald too. Ha ha. Apparently, Bert is also a blind son of a bitch. Bert, Frank. We have a little problem. Either that was the zombie, or Bert is not a fan of little problems. The three then try to kill the reanimated cadaver in cold storage. What do doctors use to crack skulls with? Surgical drills. Here, hold it, Frank. Oh. Or surgical pickaxes. The cadaver ignores Frank and Freddy, already infected by the gas, and runs straight for Bert. Ah! <laughs> Brain. Are you sure? Maybe he watched a lot of Jerry Springer. After dismembering the body, they discover that every part can survive independently. <laughs> well, that's one way to head out. Meanwhile, back at Resurrection Cemetery, the film is interrupted by a late night infomercial. Do you ever fantasize about being killed? Yes. Do you ever wonder 
about all the different ways of dying. Yes! What would be the most horrible way to die? Yes! What is the phone number? The worst way would be for a bunch of old men to get around me and start fighting and eating me alive. What time? Old men eat dinner at 3 p.m. Trash, played by Scream Queen Linnea Quigley, starts to rip off her clothes and dances on a gravestone. Trash's original name was Legs. I don't care what her name is. Evil, you've seen this over a dozen times. Pull yourself together. What? This scene gave me my first non-confusing boner. Ugh, jeez. When shooting Trash's graveyard dance, she initially showed pubic hair. However, producer Graham Henderson visited the set that day and yelled, You can't show pubic hair on television! O'Bannon had Linnea shave, and they did another take, to which Graham Henderson cried, Oh God, it's even worse! You can see everything! So, the effects guy made Linnea Quigley an alginate crotch piece resembling the bottom of a G-string, making her crotch look like a department store mannequin. Some people are lawyers or doctors. I'm an expert on Linnea Quigley's privates. Evil, what's with the wig? What wig? Why are we wearing this? Wearing what? Oh no, Evil, we are not going to the cemetery dressed like this! Unsure how to destroy the zombie, Bert remembers Ernie, the embalmer, who has a crematorium across the street. Bert and Ernie. Yeah, but according to O'Bannon, that wasn't intentional. How are we gonna get this thing over there? Give me the bone saw. He knows the bone saw is always ready. <gasps> Sadly, back at the cemetery, the show is over. What do you think this is all about? You think this is a fucking costume? This is a way of life. A life of shopping for clothing at Spirit Halloween. We then meet Ernie, who is in the middle of embalming when he's interrupted by Bert. <laughs> Take it easy. Sorry, I didn't hear you. According to Dan O'Bannon, Ernie was intended to be an escaped Nazi in hiding. And there are clues. Ernie is listening to a German marching song on his Walkman. Hanging on the wall, you can see a drawing of Hitler and a picture of his wife, Ava Braun. The moment she realized her husband was, a uh, Hitler! Ernie carries a German Walter P-38, refers to the rainstorm coming down like... It's coming down like an betrügen soldat. Which means a drunk soldier in German. And he knows his way around a crematorium. O'Bannon wanted the incinerator door to look like the one at Auschwitz, and the lighting looks like prison bars. I guess when you're desperate, you'll take help anywhere you can get it. Bert asks Ernie for a favor, getting rid of something. What the hell is in those bags? Rabbit weasels. What? Would it help if we said the weasels were Jewish? Okay, Ernie doesn't buy it, so it's better if Bert shows him. You go, severed arm. You don't need nobody. Hardest thing to burn is a heart. Tell that to the girls that reject me. <laughs> Some big favor. I can operate that goddamn thing. Me looking at the pizza oven at Sabaro. 
They incinerate the bags, but this causes the deadly gas to contaminate the air, creating acid rain that seeps into the ground, reanimating the corpses in the nearby cemetery. That tombstone wouldn't sign a release form. At this time, Frank and Freddy are feeling really sick. How I felt on Thanksgiving when someone brought another casserole! <laughs> Tina goes to the warehouse and wanders into the basement. Are you here? Freddy, I found your unlucky hat. The first time a guy wants her for her brains. Evil. <laughs> Beverly Randolph, who plays Tina, didn't know the step was gonna break. Director Dan O'Bannon had a false step put in while she was at lunch, then told her to do a test run up the stairs and filmed it. As a result, she was banged up. <laughs> Everywhere, except her bangs. The Tar Man Zombie is performed by actor and puppeteer Alan Trotman, who is best known for working with Jim Henson and the Muppets. Tar Man was so popular, Trotman reprised the character in Return of the Living Dead 2 in 1988, and the character made a cameo in Return of the Living Dead, Rave to the Grave, in 2005. Look, Tar Man, it's either ass, gas, or grass. The rest of the group arrives at the warehouse and saves Tina just in time, although suicide becomes a victim of homicide. Steel chain sales just plummeted 40%. But enough talking about him, let's talk to him! Our guest today is the Tar Man Zombie! So tell us, what was it like working on Return of the Living Dead? Brains! I hear you didn't get along with all of your co-stars. In fact, some of them said you really lost your head. Brains! Before you go, is there anything you want to say to your fans? More brains! Uh, can we get some paramedics over here right away? Thank you very much. Bye. Bert, they're on the way. <laughs> he said that like he just ordered Domino's. With Frank and Freddy getting sicker, the paramedics arrive, whose tests indicate the men are no longer alive, even though they're conscious. No blood pressure. No pulse. Oh, I mean, no blood pressure, no pulse. Shh. Shh. Those of us who aren't dead are trying to speak. Casey remembers seeing Freddy entering the funeral home, so the group attempts to reach him through the cemetery. Oh, what the fuck was that? A constipated cow? I would accuse them of lip syncing. But they have no lips! Trash lives out her fantasy by being eaten alive! Well, there's something you don't see every day. Six men fighting to take out the trash! Chuck and Casey flee back to the warehouse, but Spider, Tina, and Scuzz reach the mortuary. I have the same reaction, the Christmas carolers. Outside, the paramedics will need some help. Please, no autographs! No autographs! Ernie goes outside to get his car when he discovers the devoured paramedics. mother reacted when we chased her for a hug. Some of the zombies were paid extra to eat real calf brains. Dan O'Bannon didn't want the actors to do anything he wasn't willing to do and ate some first in front of them. 
At this point, I would believe O'Bannon brought the brains from home. Ernie tries to phone the cops, but of course the phones are dead. So they barricade the doors and windows. <laughs> Yep, exactly how I react to Christmas carolers. Send more paramedics. Ooh, and can I get some curly fries? Ernie tells Freddy that rigor mortis is setting in, and he takes the news well. No! No! Another ambulance arrives to help, and they're dead. I've seen lawyers chase less ambulances. We're gonna kill everybody that comes here. What I say when I'm leaving Taco Bell. While protecting the barricade, Scuzz gets into an arm wrestling contest. <laughs> Somehow, less barbaric than slap fighting. The group manages to grab the upper half of the zombie and they restrain her. I can feel myself rot. How I would describe being in my 30s. She explains that eating brains makes the pain go away. The pain of being dead. Has she tried Pepto Bismol? Trash, her body submerged in the toxic mud, rises up and begins to feed. <laughs> no, no, no. You're supposed to eat. The rich! With Frank and Freddy showing signs of becoming zombies, Bert has them locked in the chapel. Kicking and screaming is how I went to church. However, Tina refuses to abandon her boyfriend, Freddy. We gotta lock the door, you know that. I'm staying. It's your funeral. At least they don't have far to go. The police finally show up, and well, the result is the same. Send more cops. Wait, are you the guys that didn't tip? And where are my curly fries? Freddy finally turns and attempts to eat Tina, prompting Bert, Ernie, and Spider to rescue her by throwing acid in Freddy's face. Or was that his piss jar? Raise, raise, raise! Shut up! Make it shut up! He hasn't been this worked up since he had those damn enchiladas. You okay? <clears throat> Some damn enchiladas. <laughs> Ernie somehow breaks his foot. How bad is your foot, Ernie? Broke. He'll have to lay off his goose stepping. So Bert and Spider flee the mortuary for the police car. <laughs> what retailers see every Black Friday. They get to the car, but the large number of zombies force Bert to leave behind Ernie and Tina. <laughs> they were left behind quicker than Kevin McAllister. Surrounded, Bert totals the car, but they manage to get back inside the warehouse where they find Casey and Chuck. Who's he? He owns this place. He's the one we're gonna sue when this is all over. A blinded Freddy escapes from the chapel, so Ernie and Tina hide in the attic while Freddy breaks in. I wonder where Ernie got the idea to hide in the attic. <laughs> Let him eat your brains, Tina. In a relationship, it's called compromise. Frank manages to escape. And, still having control over his mind, climbs into the incinerator. What the music means? It can't be any hotter than my grandma's house. Outside, even more cops are overrun. Even I couldn't help myself around that much bacon. 
To get to the basement phone, Bert must face the Tar Man zombie. I'm really loving the new baseball rules. Bert contacts the police, but once again, they're overrun and devoured by zombies. This happens when they open the doors at a Taylor Swift concert. Bert finally decides to call the number on the side of the barrel, which reaches Colonel Glover. Yes, I see, uh, of course. Uh, thank you for your assistance, Mr. Wilson. One last thing, Colonel. Is your refrigerator running? Yes. Well, good for you. It looks like we've found that lost consignment of Easter eggs. With those resources, the Easter Bunny doesn't stand a chance. Notified that the zombies have taken over the area, Glover has the town destroyed by one big firework on the morning of July 4th. The code numbers, please, sir. Archimedes, hot dog, rhubarb. Mustard, onion, relish. Hold the ketchup. Hey, listen. I think the tea is ready. The nuclear cannon at the end of the film was actually a World War II German howitzer. In the wake of the nuclear strike on Louisville, Colonel Glover informs his commanding officer that everything went as planned. I wouldn't worry about the fires, General. The rain is taking care of that right now. The toxic rain falls and seeps into the ground once more, resurrecting even more zombies. The movie hints the same thing will happen again by reusing footage from earlier. The face she makes when you put it in the wrong hole. The Return of the Living Dead was a critical and moderate box office success. On a $4 million budget, it grossed over $14 million domestically. The film has spawned four sequels. When someone shambles like a zombie groaning for brains, it's because of this movie. That, or it's a session of Congress. The zombies in the film are less realistic and more stylized. They were inspired by the mummies of Guanajuato, Mexico, and the bog people of Wales, as well as artwork from EC Comics. The half-corpse zombie was a puppet created by Tony Gardner, and it launched his career as a makeup effects artist. He's worked on The Lost Boys, The Blob, Nightbreed, Army of Darkness, Hocus Pocus, Zombieland, and the Chucky series. The film has a noteworthy soundtrack as it features several Los Angeles-based death rock and punk rock bands of the era. My jam is the Wiggles. However, different home video releases have featured different soundtracks, often changing the songs due to copyright issues. Did they try paying the bands with free beer? So, would I recommend The Return of the Living Dead? Yes! The film is about a misfit group of characters coming together to solve a problem, only for it to be solved for them. ROTLD is a nihilistic, humorous, punk rock take on the zombie genre, topped with the right amount of 80s cheese. Simply put, it's a party! We've been Andy, the maniacal cinephile! Thanks for liking and subscribing! Don't forget to use our Raid Shadow Legends link in the description or scan our QR code to get those insane bonuses! We'll see you next time!